Welcome to the Expansive CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chapman, founder of Expansive CEO and X Squared Wealth Planning. Buckle in as we explore how to create true prosperity and build a business and a life that expands beyond yourself and makes a dent in the universe. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of Investment Friday with Brad Haynes, the Chief Investment Officer of Juncture Wealth Strategies, my close personal friend here, Mr. Brad, right? So we have got some really interesting stuff to talk about today um, and a couple of awesome questions from listeners who uh, who had some interesting questions about social, one about social security and one about uh, this new Secure Act 2.0 that is allowing people to uh, roll funds from 529 plans for education over to Roth IRAs. So some interesting things happening um, with policy as well. So I would love to start there. I just said the word policy, and I think that goes straight into what you wanted to talk about today. So take it away, Brad. What are we talking about? Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the craziness in the market the pullback in the market, we're down about 4.4, 4.5% from its from its high just a couple of weeks ago. And I think that's getting some people more and more nervous about, wow, is this, what what's going on? Because we have the, the stock market going down over the past couple of weeks, and we have the bond market going down over the past couple of weeks. Well, normally, when the stock market goes down, the bond market goes up. And so there's this disconnect between those two markets. And so I want to talk a little bit about why there is that disconnect and um, and and how that's going to impact equities and bonds going forward. Yeah. So when we talk about stocks and bonds, what you're saying, the disconnect that's happening, usually there's an inverse relationship, right? That's That's what we want to see anyway, right? Because bonds are supposed to be protective where stocks are supposed to be speculative or, you know, we want to shoot for the stars when we're sort of right. When we're investing in stocks, we're expecting them to go up where bonds, we're expecting them to be slow, steady, but not go down even in a bad market. That's the hope that we have as investors. Right. So obviously that is not always true. Um, Last year was certainly not the case for bonds. They were down, what, 13% yes, uh, in 2022. So that was a huge outlier. Um, but at the same time, we do know that bonds can go down. So what's happening right now that's causing that? It's a great question. So bond yields, so the yield, uh, which is kind of the rate of return that you earn on a bond once you purchase it, um, have been going up in the U.S. Treasury market which is primarily where the U.S. government sells bonds to fund our government. So it's a very deep, very liquid, very well-known, very safe asset um, from, the, from the market's perspectives. But the yields on the 10-year Treasury have, have come up pretty dramatically um, over the past couple of weeks. And a lot of people are, are, are wondering why that is the case when the markets are also, the equity markets are also selling off. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is we had the threat of a government shutdown where for a while the U.S. government couldn't issue more debt. They had run up to the debt limit. That was That's a, that's a law. You can't issue any more debt once you hit the debt, the, the statutory debt limit. And so there were no more U.S. Treasuries being offered during that time. Well, then in July, early July, Congress got together, they they put it together, and all of a sudden the U.S. Treasury started selling a ton of them. <laughs> they sell, I mean, almost a trillion dollars in a month they sold in U.S. Treasury. So there was that deluge of supply coming on the market. Well, when you have more supplies, same demand, uh, you know, the prices go down a little bit. It's it's like having Cheerios go on sale at Walmart 
If you want Cheerios, you're probably going to buy more than you would if they were not on sale. And it's the same for U.S. Treasuries. Um, those, those prices came down, yields came up, and a lot of people were stepping up to, to buy those. Similarly, that has continued to go on. Um, so right now, today, we have about a 4.3% 10-year Treasury yield. That's the highest since 2007. So to give you an idea, that is a high number relative to the past 16, 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens, and the reason that's a big deal, is because on the margin, you have people that have owned stock that are, are probably not as comfortable owning stock. They, they really would like steady, predictable income and predictable repayment of their principal. And on the margin, you're starting to see people reallocate out of stock or just, you know, making little shifts, selling some of their stocks that they've got good profits on and buying bonds where they can get five, six, seven percent um, on their on these fixed income investments so that it, it, it's more stable, it's more predictable, and they feel more comfortable within their risk tolerance. So what you're talking about right now is this, uh, I call it a phenomenon, um, over the last 20 years or so where, you know, we've been seeing that the, when I'm going to call it the 60, 40 portfolio is dead, right? How many headlines did we see like that over the last, I mean, at least five years, oh, yeah. um, longer than that, maybe even where a 60, 40 portfolio being 60% equities or stocks. 40% bonds or fixed income. And we had been seeing trends saying that that just wasn't working because the, having 40% of your portfolio in bonds meant you were having 40% of your portfolio earning one to 0% most of the time, right? Or very like having a very hard time getting anything exactly. you know, north of 2%, um, really. And so- you just, if you needed that money to live, if you needed the uh, income generation from your portfolio to live on, there you couldn't put forty percent of your portfolio there, no. and earn two percent or less. And no. so this shift is actually that's interesting, and I'm wondering if it's going to bring people back into that more balanced approach because just like you're saying, you know, it wasn't even. I mean, 80, 20, 80% 80 equities, 20% uh, bonds is seen as a moderately aggressive portfolio. And Correct. that was turning into the norm, even for, you know, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, who needed to, you know, have their portfolio generate enough income for them to live on. Yeah. In fact, you saw a lot of people relying on dividends, mm -hmm. um, you know, utility stocks, um, higher dividend consumer staple stocks, healthcare, um, and even some technology now, they were relying on those the past 20 years to fund part of their lifestyle because we just didn't have the yields or interest rates at a level that was high enough to provide the income they needed for their lifestyle. Where, whereas because the, the Federal Reserve has increased interest rates so much over the past really 15, 16 months, um, they're able to to now lock in those pretty high yields um, pretty healthily, um, and so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic. Now, the other thing that's happened over the past couple of weeks, which makes um, the U.S. Treasuries kind of fall a little bit in price or offer those higher yields, is uh, the Japan Central Bank. Um, is pursuing a, a policy of yield curve control, okay, mm -hmm. YCC. Yield, yield curve control, what they're doing is they're saying um, over the, the maturity range from zero, from one day to 30 years, we're going to make sure that those yields are pretty close to where we want them to be. And for, uh, for Japan, it was basically negative on the short term and very, very minor uh, yields on the on the long end. Well, they came out and they said because the yen has been fairly weak, okay, 
what they've been doing is then saying, okay, we're going to let those yields, the longer term yields float up a little bit more. We're going to, we're going to relax the constraints on yield curve control. So what happens in that case is now bond investors are, are taking a look and saying, Hey, is a Japanese bond now a potential substitute for a U.S. Treasury? Mm. And that that starts to come in into the calculus of making a decision of where you're going to buy large amounts of bonds. And so um, that has caused some consternation in the U.S. Treasury market, albeit I don't think it's a it's a major it's a major substitute right now. But again, people are forecasting out saying, well, if they continue to relax it and those yields truly freely float according to the market, then then the yen or the uh, the J Japanese uh, bonds could really actually be a, a pretty decent substitute for the U.S. government. So again, the more competition, similar demand, you you have prices go down, which forces those yields to go up. Now, a couple of, so, so because of that, because as those yields get higher, they have more of a substitutive effect. So if yields are at three and a half percent long-term, people may stick with their stock because they're like, eh, I probably have a 3% dividend or a two and a half percent dividend on my stock. I'm going to keep it. I don't need to pay the capital gains tax. The difference isn't that great. I'm probably going to hold on to my stock. 10-year treasury yield at four and a half. You start to go, okay, that's actually more income on a net-to-net -net basis, and it's safer. And I'm not even talking about corporate bonds, which are probably in that scenario at five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half percent on their bonds yielding. People are like, do I need to take the risk of the volatility and the volatility of the equity markets? Or can I just lock in this given these US Treasury rates or, or the corporate rates? Can I just get a diversified basket of bonds between those two and, and really kind of lock in what I need for my lifestyle? And mm -hmm. so I think more and more investors, both institutionally and retail, are starting to make the decision on the margin of, well, they're getting high enough that I want to start peeling a little bit off of my equities and locking in those higher yields with bonds. So do you, do you think that this is going to take a decent enough chunk out of the equity buyer pool that it will affect growth in the near future? Um, I don't know if it will affect growth for a long, long time, but I do think it will impact equity markets going forward. Mm -hmm. We're now at the we're now at the at a high enough yield that you're having substitutive effects. Over the past nine months, at least at our at juncture, we've had conversation with clients where people are like, hey, I'm selling a business, I'm selling some real estate. Um, I want to take that money and actually maybe I'll just buy bonds with it. Maybe I'll put it in money market for now where I'm getting 5%. Um, those decisions are very, uh, over the past 20 years, very unusual. Mm -hmm. You would That wouldn't even be the case. People would be like, hey, let's get it in. Let's lock it into those equity market prices right now um, because you know yields on money markets were you know, between zero and 1%. And, and now they're not. Now they're at five, four and a half to 5%. And that's a, that's a very competitive return uh, for a very, very safe and short-term asset. Um, so yeah, I think it's starting to have an effect. If we see the 10-year treasury yield continue to float up and let's get, let's say get to four and a half to 5%, it's going to have a much greater impact on the equity market as it gets higher. So anyone, anywhere from here on out, if that yield continues to get higher and higher, it will start to constrain, one, economic growth, and two, it will start to have a, a more powerful substitutive effect uh, between equities and bonds. Interesting. Well, we'll 
we'll just keep having conversations and seeing, seeing what happens. Um, cause I know, I mean, I've gotten those questions too, you know, where can we, where can we shift some of this to bonds? Does it make sense? You know, that's, that's the question that I typically, typically get. Does it make sense? And honestly, yeah, if you're going to get 5% on your bond portfolio, it does start to make sense to shift a portion. Um, not all of it, unless that's literally all you need. Right. Um, but right. There's always a, you know, work with working with a financial planner like yourself is really, really important because if you're 30 years old and you're really starting to ramp up in your career, bonds still at 5% are probably not the area you want to invest in because your time horizon is so, so long Mm -hmm. equities are going to help you build that real purchasing power. Uh, whereas bonds probably won't over that long period of time. But if you're starting to approach retirement or you're just retired or you're, you've are you been retired for quite some time, you know, these are some of the people that are looking at um, bonds more uh, more seriously and saying, do they have a bigger piece of my pie? Should they, should they be more, should we allocate more dollars towards them than, than we have in equities or than we do currently. And, and that's, it, it's been happening. Um, I think it's a welcome, it's a welcome development in, in my mind because for so long, the Federal Reserve has, has hurt savers mm-hmm. and, you know, for spenders, right? They've had to, we've had almost zero interest rates or one very, very low interest rates for a very long time. And that's hurt people who are savers the retirees, the people on fixed incomes, the people that um, need that steady income. Whereas now it's more of a balance between the two and that's healthy for the U.S. economy. Now, it may not be super healthy for the equity markets over the next little while. Mm. So watch out for that volatility, right? Yeah, unfortunately. (laughs) That's always, I, I feel... Every time we get on this call, we're like, yeah, it's going to be volatile. And and honestly, (laughs) that's unfortunately the case for for many equities. But particularly given given where equities are today, it's probably an important consideration. So I wanted to get to a couple of questions uh, that I mentioned at the top. And this is a conversation that, I mean, I have with every client that comes in the door. And then as they, you know, start to approach social security age, we have this conversation a lot. Um, but one, one, uh, person in particular, Bob. So shout out again to Bob from Huntsville, Alabama. Thank you for asking this very insightful question. He is reading the news and seeing that it's saying in 2033, the social security fund is going to run out. And those are the headlines that we see. That's what they that's what they always say. You know, as of this date, the social security fund is going to run out. And they're not giving the true context of what that actually means. So then the questions that I get are, you know, when when how soon can I start taking social security to make sure that I get any of it? Does that mean it's literally not going to be there when I'm 75? And I really need it. You know, like that's, those are the questions that those kind of headlines elicit for financial advisors. And so what, what do you see? How can you illuminate this question from your seat? Yeah. So from what I see, uh, social security is, it is in trouble um, just based on everything to have in the, in the, in the social security trust fund today versus the payments they're they're promising okay so is that where the it's going to run out yeah the trust fund is where the the dollars are that fund social security so that is going to it is is estimated to run out by 2033 now uh unfortunately for bob that's not the one that's probably going to blow up first it's medicare and medicaid that is actually in worse financial spot okay well, however, Bob's not going to like that answer. <laughs> no, I know. I'm sorry, Bob. Um, however, there is a silver lining here. 
And the one is if you are retired or close to retirement, your prob your benefits will probably be protected. However, your grandchildren's benefits are probably going to be very, very minimal because that's how they're going to fix the problem. They, they go down. So if you noticed over the past couple of years, well, really the past couple of decades, they've raised the social security ages where you, you, where you qualify for partial and or full payments up a couple of years. Um, I mean, I believe when my father started taking, it was 62 um, and, and now it's 67 for mm -hmm. people to get a full payment. That is going to continue. That is part of the, that is part of correcting the issue. So it still looks like you're not going to have it, but they're delaying it out a few years for every person. What that does, um, when Social Security was put into place, the Social Security age that you qualified for it was the same as the um, mortality rate for people of that year. So they mm -hmm. matched it. Well, thank goodness we live in the United States. We have great health care. We have great nutrition, um, at least up until a, de a, a generation ago. And so our age went up a lot. Our expected mortality age went up a lot. Well, Social Security kept the same ages. And so now you have people living 20 to 30 years beyond what uh, receiving Social Security. So there's a couple of things they're going to do. One, they're going to raise the ages uh, for full benefits. And two, they're going to cut down promises to future generations. Um, in fact, I don't th even think my generation will we'll get partial payments, but I don't think we're going to get what our parents or our grandparents received in terms of the dollar amount, um, just simply because it's, it just won't be there. Now, one of the things that, that we have to also understand about Social Security is um, it's a promise. There aren't really dollars there, mm. okay? There's U.S. Treasuries in the trust, okay? So Social Security basically buys treasuries from the federal government to fund these things. So they could statutorily come in, change the law, and they could fund it a lot more quickly than you think. So it's not, uh, it, it's a lot of money. So let me, let me, I'm not dismissing the size of this problem at all but we could fix it in a number of years by doing a couple of things. The problem is doing those things is politically very, very difficult for any one party to do. Um, the only thing I think that the Democrats and the Republicans would agree on is that Social Security is not going to go defunct. Mm. How that's going to happen, they will completely disagree on. But the aim is, is both those parties will not allow that to go defunct because um, that is the largest voting demographic or voting block in the country is right. people who are on Social Security. So, Bob, don't fear. Your Social Security will be there, but your grandchild may have a much less generous benefit than than perhaps you, uh, than you will experience in your life. And the other, the other aspect I wanted to mention about that um, from the CFP side is that Social Security is annuitized, or, the, or to to put it in a less uh, jargony way, if you take it at sixty two. So right now, that's the earliest you can take your own retirement benefit if you're retired. Um, is at age 62, and you're going to get a lower dollar amount than it, every single month than if you wait until age 67. At 67, you're going to get a higher dollar amount. And if you kick it out all the way to age 70 and wait all the way, that's the longest you can wait where your benefit's going to keep increasing to age 70, that's where you get your highest monthly payment amount. And so people... Uh, start to ask me this question of, okay, when's the right time to take it? And the honest answer is, if you live to, you know, the 
the average age, which is what this is all based on. So I think for, I think it for men and women, it's right around 83, 84 right now. So let's say you're a woman, your expected age is 84. It doesn't matter if you take it at 62, 67, or 70. If you live until age 84 and you pass away at 84, you got the same exact amount over that whole time. It's not until you potentially live longer than your expected age. That's when you start to get the benefit of waiting. So if you live to 90 or 95 or 100, then yeah, you get a lot more money if you waited to start till 67 or age 70. But if you, you know, are right at that age 83 to 85, it's pretty much break even no matter when you start taking your benefit. Um, and it's, and it's that way by design, but I think it's fascinating. I didn't realize, I knew that, that life expectancies were shorter when social security started. I didn't realize they were even like, it was like, all right, we expect you to actually, you know, kick the bucket at 63. So here you go, take your benefit for one year. And now they're, like you said, they're funding 20 years on average, at least if, if our, if our average expected age is, you know, 83, 84. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 um, I mean, good for us, good for the people who have, have, have lived it for a long time. Um, but I think in the future, we're, we're not going to be able to do that. And so I think those are some of the tough decisions that no political party wants to address. And no one wants to be the person who took away social (laughs) security benefits. No, no. (laughs) No. So, you know, it's going to be, they're going to kick the can down the road for quite, quite a while until until it can't be kicked down any further and they're going to fund the trust fund and they're going to cut benefits. They're going to increase the, uh, the withholding for, for the tax withholding on current workers, uh, to fund it. And, uh, and so it's, it's one of the things that to going back to your point, I think, uh, United States citizens or people who are planning to, to rely on that in the future are younger generations have to take they have to take uh their retirement savings very seriously and they start have they have to start planning now and start funding those 401k's 403b's you know setting aside some money in Roth IRAs you know really being proactive because social security will not be there as much as you may want it to be um in the future so those younger generations really do need to to take that seriously. So let's be, let's be super transparent here. How old are you today? August 17th, 2023. I am 52 years old. Okay. It's 52. So, because you said you don't believe your generation is going to have the exact same benefits as people who are retiring in the next couple of years. Yeah. I mean, I think they'll between me, uh, between now and the time I take which I plan on taking it at 70. Um, I think between now and then they're going to either cut the benefit or take it from 70 to 72. Okay. So I am 39 as of today and I am in, I am in agreement with that. I feel like we're, they're going to push back. So right now, so as it stands, if we both of us looked at our statements, it would say your full retirement age is 67. Correct. And so, you know, older, older generations, that was 66 or 65, but for us, it's 67. That hasn't changed in a long time. And so there's, I don't think there's any way that someone I'm 39, anywhere near my age range is going to have a full retirement age of 67. I think it's going to be 68, 69, possibly even 70 by the time we get to, you know, being close to taking social security benefits. Um, and there, I, I, I'm not sure this is the other piece that I've heard a little bit like means testing, right? Do you actually need it? That might come into play a little bit as well. Uh, Uh, For sure. That's going to come into play. They they've been kicking that idea around for a long time. And, um, I think it makes sense because, 
uh, right now, the higher your income for your 40 quarters that qualify for Social Security, you get more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So oddly enough, the highest income earners get the highest benefits. Now there's a max on it, but still it's, it's an odd thing for a retirement supplement program that's intended to take care of people who um, were, were, were not able to save for retirement nearly as much as, you know, there's a lot of people in, in hard, hard financial circumstances, um, many times outside their control that, um, you know, they're getting paid far, far less than, you know, a CEO for social security. It's just, it's a, it's a bizarre, almost backwards, um, mm. looking thing. Now that I, I think they will have, I think they will do means testing because, you know, a retiree that's generating $200,000 from their pension doesn't need social security nearly as much as some, someone that was a elementary school teacher, they retired and their pension covers not as much as they need to live. So, right. uh, you know, it's, it, 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 that will happen as part of this. So the other thing that you mentioned, and so when I'm doing planning, uh, with people who are anywhere in, you know, 50 and below, really. Um, a lot of times we leave it off the calculation. Like that's their comfort level is to just, what if, what if there's no social security? What does it look like if we have to, you know, support ourselves completely? And then if social security is there in any way, shape or form, it's a bonus and it's helpful. So honestly, that's a lot of the calculations that I run. And I always ask that question, do you want, do you want to have social security in there or do you not? Um, and almost always the answer is no, I don't want to see it in there. Even with people who are closer to retirement, it's what happens if we don't rely on all of it. Right. And that's, it's, it's more conservative to do it that way. And I think that's, I mean, in my generation, since the time I started working in my profession, um, They've, they've always told us it's not going to be there. It's not going to be there. We're running out of money. And so the dates have actually come closer a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, they stabilize around that early 2030 range, but now we're getting closer to that range. And so, you know, I'm, I'm guessing in the presidential election next year, and certainly in the congressional elections two years after that, that is going to start to heat up as one of the main topics of conversation and of debate. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see, uh, cause you really, it's going to really reflect badly on you as the party or individual or, you know, political force that takes on those very, very difficult changes. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Um, that leads into the, Last question, though, for today, which is that 529 to Roth IRA uh, thing, which is actually really, really cool. Um, so I found this fascinating when you told us about it. I right? found this fascinating because this has been a huge need for years. So I'm great. I'm really happy you did the research on this. Yeah. So I had you know, someone actually asked me about it. Like, what's this? And I was like, you know, I haven't heard a whole lot about it. Let me research. And sure enough, it's starting in 2024. So you can't do it yet. But starting in 2024, people who have been funding 529 plans for education. So this is a section 529 plan and it is meant for higher education. Uh, so people will fund these accounts and you can use them for higher education purposes. And when you use it, for higher education purposes, I'm being very clear about that, the benefit is tax-free. So you put money in, most of the money is after tax. You might get a little bit of a state tax deduction when you make a contribution to your state's 529 plan, maybe, but it is mostly after tax. But the growth of that money comes out completely tax-free when it's used for higher education purposes. So when, you know, our you know, parents and grandparents were saving for college for some of us who had 
um, 529 plans, this is a amazing benefit. And when I'm doing planning with people who, um, you know, are in their late twenties or thirties, um, even forties who are wanting to save for their kids, they're like, okay, I really want, I don't want my kids to have a ton of student loan debt. So I really want to pay for this. They put a lot of money into 529 plans. The problem with that as you know, I don't know if you can guess with the state of how education is right now, a lot of people are opting to not go to college or opting to, you know, do other things. So we have had a lot of, um, a lot of new policies over the last five years or so as well that are allowing for allowing people to use up to $10,000 for private high school or, you know, private tuition, middle school, right? Like or using it for other educational purposes before college, also being able to use it for um, different technical schools. You know, so, okay, you're not going to a four-year college, but you're going to an accredited technical school. You can use your 529 money for that as well. So as the um, public opinion towards going to a four-year college has been shifting, they have been making different concessions to how you can use 529 plans. And this is just the next iteration of that, um, which is actually really, really beautiful because say you save quite a bit into a 529 plan. Let's say you have $50,000 saved into a 529 and your child decides to go to one semester of college and then they get some you know, awesome job. And they're like, I don't need to go to college anymore. And you have $40,000 left um, in this 529, the SECURE Act 2.0, I think is what it's called, is allowing up to $35,000 to be rolled from a 529 plan into a Roth IRA for the same beneficiary. So Brad, your parents saved, saved money for you and you decided not to go to college and did something else instead. If the 529 plan has been open for 15 years and there haven't been any new contributions in the last five years, so let's say, you know, you're 27 at this point, you still have that 520, 529 money sitting there. Well, since you're the named beneficiary on that, they can now roll 35,000 of that into a Roth IRA in your name. And you now have $35,000 of Roth IRA money, which when you let that grow and you get to age 59 and a half, everything comes out of that tax-free. So this is, is, that's such a huge benefit to those, to the, to the beneficiaries. That is such a massive way to start, start off saving for retirement. So, so well. Yeah. If you have $35,000, I haven't pulled up the calculation, but even if you just start $35,000, in your 20s. If you had that in a Roth IRA, no taxation. I don't know, Brad, Brad say say words for a couple of minutes on okay. that. And I'm I'm, I'm going to pull that up. I'm going to pull up. You're going to do love, some calculations here, I can tell. Right? You're going to find out how much is 35,000 tax-free invested in the equity market. How much is that when that child decides to actually retire? You know, this goes back to social security and our younger generation having to really take advantage and really be serious about their own retirement planning because social security probably won't be there as much as they will need it to be in retirement. But it's, it's, I imagine it's a, it's, it's quite a bit of money. Um, maybe 350,000 starting off. Maybe. So, um, so I'm going to share this. Um, so I'm sharing my screen right now. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening, I'll walk you through it. But if you're watching, um, I love this little calculator here. It's at investor.gov. Um, it's a compound interest calculator. I use this one when I want to just do quick calculations. I think it's great. So let's say that you've got $35,000 as your initial investment. You're not making any monthly contributions. We're just, we're just doing that. And we'll say this is a 25 year old. And so by the time they're 65, we're going to put 40 years in there. We're going to estimate our interest rate at our long-term average of 8%, we're going to give that a 2% variance. Sometimes it'll be 10, sometimes it'll be six. 
compound daily. Yeah, we'll do annual. Yeah. And so this is going to calculate. So this is what it would be. And this this is not like a super sophisticated one, so it's not going to take into account taxation. So this is this is pretty accurate. So at eight percent average over forty years, that thirty five thousand dollars. Brad, what does that say? Can you read it? The red, the red line in the middle at eight seven hundred sixty thousand dollars. Yeah. In and forty if, years. In forty years, by not touching it, not doing anything. Yeah. At ten, a, at ten percent, it's one point five million, almost one point yeah. six million. Even yeah, at six I mean, percent, it's at three sixty. Yeah, it's that time in the market. Time is the most important thing to make to to help us um, achieve our financial goals. You know, a lot of people put efforts on how much they save, and oftentimes that is an important starting place. But really getting time in the markets for as long as possible, that time is really where money, money, it, it makes up the difference. I mean, in the in the last few years on that on that illustration, you noticed it really hockey sticked up because mm -hmm. as you have more dollars, if you earn, you know, if you have a million dollars and you earn eight percent, that's eighty thousand dollars, right? Well, if you have thirty five thousand dollars and you earn eight percent. Eh, that's not eighty thousand dollars, right? So right. the last couple of years, you really get that hockey stick effect in the balance of the account um, because you've been in it for so long. So it's a, yeah, it's such a powerful tool that, that grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles can really help out. Yeah, the other the other special thing with that is that you can fund a five twenty nine plan starting when your child is born, where a Roth IRA, you need earned income. You have to have earned income in order to put money into a Roth IRA. So children actually can use Roth IRAs uh, if they have earned income. There are all kinds of, you know, kind of planning tools around that if you own a business or whatever. That is a legitimate tool that you can use. But for most people, this actually represents a much easier way to potentially save for your children if you want to start early. And think about that. If you can put away 20 bucks or 50 or $100 a month for your kid into a 529, whether they go to college or not, you've got a huge runway of time where you're saving. And then that could potentially in the future roll into a Roth IRA. So Yeah, I mean, my, my sister... Um... She has a couple of grandkids and she has started a 529 program for each of her grandchildren. Well, one, one set or one, uh, two girls are, their dad is going to become uh, a very highly skilled dentist. And so those kids probably won't need those 529 programs to go to college. They may, they may not, I don't know, but this is a great tool that when they get to that point, let's say dad says, I got it covered, no problem. Well, you she can take that, roll it into a Roth IRA for these children and get them set off in, on the right foot from a retirement standpoint. Hmm. I'm so excited. This is a this is like a really cool development. So yeah. We'll see. 2024. We'll see what uh that's again, that's when that's when all of this goes into effect. You can't do it right now. Um, but in 2024, we'll see. See Thanks, Congress. It's, right, something, it's one of the few times something super well helpful for helpful for people who have five twenty nines um, and want to use them wisely. So, Thanks. all right. Well, those were some super fun questions um, that we got to answer. And as always, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to send them over to me. Send them over to Brad. Um, our emails are in the show notes. And we would love to address what you're wondering about and thinking about in the markets, uh, in financial planning, in, I don't know, what's happening in Utah, Brad, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Raining right now. So <laughs> we'll answer a lot of questions, people. Um, no, <laughs> just kidding. 
mostly finance related, but yes. Uh, so thank you for being here as always, Brad, and we'll see you next week. Sounds good. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and be sure to like and subscribe. And again, if anything resonated with you from this episode, I would love to hear from you. Email me at Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, at expansiveceo.com and tell me about it. And if you're ready for your greatest expansion, you can find ways to work with me at expansiveceo.com and at xsquaredwealthplanning.com. That's X, the numeral two, wealthplanning.com. So until next time, remember that there is enough, you are enough, and your birthright in this lifetime is to be expansive.